This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 748, recorded on April 23rd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, uh, it's great to see you all. And just like the last time we recorded earlier this week, the weather is beautiful outside, although it's a little chillier. It's only 59 Fahrenheit today, but bright and sunny and a very nice day. Yeah, it's been chilly ever since our last uh, recording, right? It's, it has. This morning it was eight, now it's 14 Celsius, but it is sunny. It's a very nice day. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's um, a little blustery here. It's 54 Fahrenheit, 12 Celsius. The wind's 23, gusting 33 out of the west. Um, so it's kind of kind of breezy, but nice and clear and not too cold. The blustery day. Wasn't that a blustery. Winnie, Winnie the Pooh thing? It, it was Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> um, Alan, last time you were here was snowing or flurrying. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, we had snow coming down that day. No, no accumulation, right? No, it, it didn't stick to the, we got a little bit, it kind of coated the grass, but um, that was about it. It's funny, you know, always this time of year, it gets warm and everybody gets excited. The flowers come out, the grass starts growing and then boom, you get really low. You get these snap cold, yeah. Snap cold, it's funny stuff. Well, we have a rather small twiv today. Yeah. It, it's not the smallest ever. The smallest ever was me and Dixon in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I had a few episodes with me and someone else. Um, but it's rather and Rich small. And, Rich and I did an episode together. Is that right? Very early on, yeah. The Invincible Twiv. Yeah, that's I funny. think that was just Rich and me. Yeah, that's funny. That was good. I remember that, yeah. yeah. So I was just thinking today, would I do a Twiv with one person? I mean, that's not really the idea of Twiv, right? It's supposed to be a conversation. So I guess you could have yourself in two Zoom windows and have a conversation with yourself. <laughs> you, could, you could have a conversation with Cookie Monster. Yes, you could put a Cookie Monster doll on the other monitor. And <laughs> so if I ever had to, if I if ever no one showed up, <laughs> I probably would just go get Amy and say, "Let yeah. do a twiv, even if you're not prepared. Come and and say yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes." <laughs> so anyway, um, we have today is uh, COVID day because Tuesday was non-COVID day, so. Friday is COVID day, and we have uh, a paper and a snippet for you. The paper is uh, an article published in PLOS Pathogens. High throughput single copy sequencing reveals SARS-CoV-2 spike variants coincident with mounting humoral immunity during acute COVID-19. And this is from a variety of uh, laboratories at the NIH uh, in uh, Bethesda. And the first, let's see, there are three co-first authors, Ko, Mokhtari, and Mudvari. And the last author is Eli Boritz. And uh, it's uh, <clears throat> real. I thought it was interesting. A good, a good fraction of it I did not understand. And you hear <laughs> about that because I... <laughs> Uh, but you don't have to, I think, because um, the, the results are very interesting. Yeah, there's a there's a laboratory part of the paper and there's a computational part of the paper. And the la the laboratory part I thought was really cool. And the computational mm -hmm. part I thought the results were really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is about sequencing. And as you know, as the, this pandemic has spread, uh, we have been doing a lot of sequencing of isolates from individual people, you know, the next strain that, we, that I picked some time ago has all those genome sequences. You know, typically do a nasopharyngeal swab and do high throughput sequencing. Uh, but um, the problem is that when you do that, you actually get a consensus sequence of what's in that particular person, right? You don't actually see the quasi-species which is a name for, or or what is the other name, Brianne? What do you call it in your class? Mutant cloud or? Mutant cloud or mutant swarm. Swarm, yes. Since I'm an old guy, I use quasi-species because I was a graduate student when the quasi-species paper first came out. The fact that every virus 
collection that you shed that's in a cell culture is a collection of many, many variants. Maybe not even every, not any genome is the same as any other. It's called the quasi species. And this is this is really something that's not unique to um, viruses. I mean, bacteria do something similar. The mutation rate's a little lower per base in yeah. general, but yeah. um, and it turns out what we now know that people are when people are able to do these single cell sequencings, um, the cells in your body don't necessarily all have the same sequence, That's even right. though you have one genome. As you grew these billions of cells that make up your body, they accumulated mutations yeah. because replication is mutagenic and um, viruses just do it, um, you know, faster and, and more because right. they're more mutagenic. And, and one of the reasons why this is actually what we see is because when we do this sequencing, we're not usually doing sequencing from one cell. We're usually taking nucleic acid from a bunch of cells um, in order to do the sequencing. And then we do kind of short reads of the sequencing. So we, we sequence short pieces of that nucleic acid um, in theory, multiple times. We've sheared up all of that many copies of nucleic acid. We sequence it all. And then what we try to do is sort of computationally figure out where the small pieces overlap and put together a huge, long um, piece uh, over, overlapping DNA. And so what we don't necessarily know is if we see some base pair change, is that a sequencing error or is that an actual variant that was in the original lots of cells? Um, and we just say, well, most of the time it's an A here. So we're going to say it's an A here. Uh, we don't get that variation. And we don't, if we found two different mutations on two different pieces of the DNA, we wouldn't know were those from the same original piece of nucleic acid or were they from different pieces? Because we are using all of these little fragments that we're stitching together. I think this right. uh, idea that... And we, what we end up calling the final product of this averaging process a consensus sequence, which is a little misleading because consensus usually means complete agreement. <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas what we're really doing here is a, a majority vote sequence. Yes, <laughs> so that's it's, good. You know, yeah. it's usually this, and so we're going to call it that. Um, but it's, it's referred to as the consensus sequence, what you get out of this process. Yeah, majority vote is good. I remember when I did... Maxim Gilbert sequencing in the 80s on poliovirus, anything less than 15% of the population you'd never see on that kind of sequencing um, by, by nature of the way it is. Now, the, the high throughput is a little better, but as we've said, uh, the error rate of the procedure is quite high. And so it's hard to pick up uh, the quasi-species by doing these these methods that uh, we've been discussing. And so that's one of the goals of this paper, to do single genome uh, amplification and sequencing. Right, because we see these variants popping up that, you know, oh, this mutation occurred and, and so forth. But what we're really saying is this mutation becomes dominant in the consensus sequence at a particular yeah. point. And so what they wanted to do was look in more detail. How, how fast does that happen? Is that what's going on here? In fact, you know, for the first, I don't know, 10 months or so of last year, People were saying, well, this virus is changing slowly. The, any two isolates differ only by, by about 10 bases. And then, you know, suddenly in November, we started to see these variants with many, many more changes, which is now de rigueur. But uh, I remember Theodora Hatsianu, when she was here, said, you know, the, this one variant, I forgot which amino acid change, they can find that in the earliest sequences from last year, but it's just a very, very low percentage. And so we're not really getting the right picture. We'd like to know single genome. And that way, as you'll see in this paper, you can see evolution occurring in a single patient, not just the whole population, right? And we always say for HIV, evolution occurs in a single patient. It does, as you'll see, it does here for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and so that's what they try and do here. Um, so they develop a, a technique so it's sequencing, but they use computational pipelines um, to eliminate the error as best they can. So it's called a high throughput single genome sequencing approach. So they can sequence individual RNA genomes in a patient sample. And they're focusing on spike, ORF3, envelope, and membrane protein genes. Uh, and this is the part I don't really understand. You know, they add tags to the 
So what you do is you take the nasopharyngeal swab and you extract the RNA and you, and you convert it to DNA with reverse transcriptase and they add specific tags, which are sequences uh, to it so they can identify it. And then they put it through a pipeline to remove errors, PCR errors, uh, and so forth. And there's actually, since this is in PLOS, it's an open access paper, so anybody can go look at it. And I recommend when you're not driving, um, go and, and look up this paper, at least for figure one, because it outlines the technique and this um, this very cool um, thing where you attach your your PCR primer has a, um, a barcode, a unique sequence mm -hmm. on it. And so that attaches and amplifies once on the mRNA, and then subsequent copies of that will have that mRNA with that barcode. And so you can then go back computationally and separate out the sequences that came from particular individual molecules that have that barcode on them. Just as a aside, there is another way to try and say, what's a sequencing error versus a real mutation, it's called circular consensus sequence correction. You basically make circular molecules and sequence around them many times, and the error, the sequencing errors are gonna pop up just here and there on the circle. But a real change will be in every read around that circle, right? Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So it'll be, so basically sequencing errors won't always be in the same place every time. So it'll be at one o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock hop. Right. <laughs> um, so anyway, but this is not that. This is different. They say, you know, we do things that won't remove errors uh, that are not addressed by that will uh, address remove errors that are not addressed by circular consensus sequencing. Uh, so they validated first using um, they they have a DNA copy of uh, uh, of the original WA one first isolate from the U.S and they make transcripts and they sequence them and they can show that uh, they get very low error rates and they can see errors from the reverse transcriptase uh, from the PCR and just during the sequencing make errors uh, as well. Uh, and in vitro transcription, of course, because that will introduce errors uh, as well. And the plasmid, you know, you grow the plasma up in bacteria. So lots of sources of errors, but they find that they have very good accuracy. So uh, they go on and do the experiment. So the first experiment, so they have the, the WA1 reference isolate, again, the first uh, isolate from the US. They have a fourth passage, a fourth passage uh, sample of that from Vero cells. So nasopharyngeal swabs into Vero cells for passages only. So that's pretty early passage, right? It's fresh mm -hmm. out of the nose. Yeah, <laughs> fresh out of the nose, yes. <laughs> and so they <clears throat> do their, their single genome sequence analysis uh, on it. And uh, they find 18 unique haplotypes, so combinations of mutations in between three and 174 um, of genomes per haplotype. So 17 haplotypes, and they saw anywhere between three and 174 genomes for each of those 17 haplotypes. Um, and they have many reads, uh, that, so over 500 reads support this, so it's, it's, it's accurate. Um, over half of all the single genome sequences differed from the reference, so the WH, WA1 reference sequence, which was published, at one or more nucleotide positions, okay? So every genome has one or more changes compared to the reference. Uh, so these 17 mutations were all non-synonymous, which means they give rise to amino acid changes. And they are clustered almost entirely in the, in the end terminal domain of the spike and the furin cleavage site. That's really cool, right? Um, the end terminal domain, of course, is next to the receptor binding domain. It's got antibody epitopes in it. Uh, the furin cleavage site, of course, is the unique part of this uh, spike that it's cleaved by furin. We've talked a lot about that before. Nine uh, single nucleotide variants and two distinct insertions of amino acids. 
And that clustering, I mean, that that really kind of underscores the idea that these are changes that are probably helping the virus adapt to cell culture. Exactly. In some way, they're giving it some additional fitness advantage in cell culture. Exactly. Right. So, so these might help the virus generally reproduce in cells. Um, they're, you know, obviously not going to be immune selection related because there's no immune processes here. Right. Exactly. When it, which gets students every year on the questions. I, you know, give them a, a delete a, a, an immune antagonist from a virus. What's the effect in cell culture? And half of them say it's going to be debilitated in cell culture, you know. There's no immune response. At least there are no antibodies. Right. Um, yeah, so that's what they think is happening. Because remember, this virus has been circulating throughout China, and then it gets to Washington, and then it is introduced into Vero cells, and it, well, <laughs> starts to hey, change. you chill out. <laughs> <laughs> and they say that we know this. When you put it in cells, we get changes in the furin cleav cleavage sites that's been published before. Um and so that's what they say. They think this is a, it, it's, it's a lot of changes going on in this cell culture, as you'll see more than we're going to see in the people. And they say this is um, a product of cell culture adaptation. And they say these results show that the virus can accumulate considerable genetic diversity uh, as revealed at the single genome level. So if you just sequenced the, the genome by standard methods, you would get the, content, the WA1 sequence that's already published wouldn't be any different. At least you would for a certain number of passages. <clears throat> yeah. So what might, what might happen is, so these are mutations that are popping up that are clustering in particular areas and suggesting maybe there's an adaptation, but overall the population is retaining the consensus sequence. If you, I suspect if you passage it enough and keep it going in Vero cells, eventually some of these will become fixed yes. and maybe predominate Most because likely, they yeah. confer an advantage. They, they will suddenly become the, you know, most voted for. Yes. <laughs> or whatever we were talking, we called it before. Yes. So again, the the um, 18 haplotypes, so a, a combination of different mutations in between three and 174 uh, indiv individual virus genomes per haplotype. So it's, you know, it's it's not huge. So you wouldn't see these on a consensus sequencing approach. But as Alan said, they might be fixed. Yeah, they might end up uh, rising to the top. So, um, yeah, and it's ahead. sort of interesting that they're you know they talk about them as haplotypes, um, and so haplotypes yeah. are a, a set of basically it's a set of DNA that's um, acquired together, or a set of DNA that's uh, inherited together. Um, and so I usually talk about haplotypes with students in terms of things like MHC, um, although there are a few different haplotypes in the human genome where you tend to. Um, inherit certain genes together. Um, but what that might mean is that maybe some of these um, changes, uh, theory changes in the protein, are only really going to work if there's also another compensatory change elsewhere. Um, and so this isn't just showing you random changes that are popping up. This is showing you kind of combinations of changes that are happening together. But in this case, a haplotype refers to combinations of mutations in the RNA gene. Exactly, yeah, yes, right, exactly. Right, yeah. The original definition was for chromosomal DNAs, right? Yeah. Exactly. All right. So then they moved to uh, human respiratory samples and they do some experiments to look at the quality because they figure there's going to be some quality issues with nasopharyngeal swabs as opposed to, you know, sterile cell culture you have in the laboratory contaminants, inhibitors, and so forth. So they had to do some evaluation. But I thought a couple of things were interesting. First, so these are, you know, samples who uh, are being tested for COVID, and these are the positive ones, obviously. Seven people, and the viral loads range. So using PCR uh, to quantify, the viral loads range from 314 RNA copies per milliliter to over 3 million RNA copies per milliliter. Amazing range, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, these people are all different stages of infection, I presume. And also the sampling is uh, is not consistent, right? You know, depending on who did it. I, when I go for a test here, I do it. But maybe someone does it different. They go, boom, you're supposed to do it three times, but maybe some people go hard. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right? I actually do it six times because um, once... 
it, it came back, said there wasn't enough sample. So I said, hey, heck with that. Um, and um, their recovery, was, in the end, they, they validated this single genome sequencing for the um, nasopharyngeal swabs. And they also s could do high throughput, so multiplex, doing many samples at the same time. Um, multiple samples can be combined in individual runs uh, and still achieve sufficient sequencing depth for minor variant uh, detection. And this is actually you know, a really important piece to this paper because what they want to do is the next part where they're actually looking at patients and sort of making some comparisons with immune responses and looking at this patient over time. Um, but they have to show that you can actually do this on the RNA that's coming directly out of a patient, first of all. Um, and part of the reason why they have to do that is because they've already shown us that if you put the virus in culture, after it comes out of the patient, it changes. Yeah. Um, and so they say, okay, so we, it changes if you put it in culture, we can actually um, get virus directly out of a patient and have this process work, even though there are inhibitors and all of these problems. So we can do it. Yes. Um, and that means that finally they have established the methodology to do the question that they want to do at the end. Right. Right. It, it, they got to go straight to the snot for this. Yeah. <laughs> And they say that we can get a recovery of between 12 and 1,276 sing single genome sequences for each of these samples. So that's enough for their analysis. All right, so now um, they, they look at, they do their, H, their high throughput single genome sequence analysis as uh, using these seven samples, seven study participants. And the samples, the nasopharyngeal samples were taken between eight and 17 days since the onset of, of clinical illness. And that's important as you'll see in a moment. They found in participants one, two, and six, a single haplotype only. Remember there were 18 in the cell culture. So here, less diversity. And two to three haplotypes in the other four participants. Furthermore, no structural signature. Remember we said in the cell culture and terminal domain of spike and the furin cleavage site were the main, that's what they mean by a structural signature. It's kind of random. They have one single nucleotide change in the in this downstream region of the spike gene, four in ORF3 and six, and two synonymous SNPs, which don't change the amino acid. So they say overall, this is, and uh, notable for being having relative sequence homogeneity compared to the results uh, from the cell cultures. Which right. is probably because there are so many more pressures on the virus in vivo with the immune system attacking it. And, um, and so any change, I mean, these, it, it's a little more free to screw around in the, in the Vero cells, right? It's not like some antibody is going to take it out or the immune system is going to take it out if it doesn't grow quite as fast or, right. um, whereas here, if, if it falls a little bit behind, it's gone. Well, I think right. in cells, it's a, it's a host range jump, right? You're going from people right. to cells and it, not only that, it's kidney cells and it's vervet monkey kidney cells. And here, I mean, this has been in humans for a while. So unless the there's, environment. Unless there's yeah. pressure, which is what they're going to look at now, unless there's pressure, they're not Good seeing point. much changes, right? Right. And, and you can also imagine that in a patient, there probably are, maybe the patient is infected with some swarm of viruses, but there probably are not that many that are going to be able to do things like overcome barriers to get into cells and start mm -hmm. this process. And so there was probably sort of almost a focusing of which particular uh, viral genome happens to be the winner to start reproducing um, and causing this in the people. And so we're going to see kind of that focusing. And then there isn't necessarily a lot of room, as Alan said, to play around. Yeah, I think by this time in the outbreak, this, this virus is pretty good at going person to person. So the only selections you would see are immune, likely immune response selections. So that's what they hypothesize. They say maybe um, there's not enough immune pressure, antibody pressure at this point in these patients. So they look at the antibodies. They look at antibody uh, binding uh, from these patients. So they have some of them, they have some serum samples available, at one in three only actually. And they measure uh, 
antibody binding to spike. And um, they see a rise in binding between the earliest available time point. So for participant one, that's day nine, and participant three, that's day 17, and later time points, you know, days 16 and nine and 27 for the other. So they can see a rise. So they have multiple samples. They can see a rise in spike binding antibodies in the later time points in these patients. Um, and then they use, they say, well, where, are the, where is this antibody binding to? So they use some monoclonals that, whose epitopes have been mapped on the spike and they do competition. So they add the mo increasing amounts of the monoclonal and see when it competes off the, the serum antibody from binding. And they can see uh, serum binding to N-terminal domain, receptor binding domain, and the S2 domain uh, in both of these uh, people in the trial. They also found an increase in binding from these two people that wasn't competed by any of the, by uh, the monoclonals that they used, and they say must be something else, a different epitope that's being yeah. recognized here. And which is which is um, something that kind of ties into something we've mentioned about a lot of these studies where people are looking at the variance of concern and saying, well, this monoclonal binds with less affinity or this site has been affected. And here, when you look at actual serum, well, okay, yeah, this one may not bind as well. This may, this may be competed off, but the serum has this whole population of yeah. stuff in it yeah. to, to throw at that. And so they, they were looking at the, their conclusion is there's a broadening of the immune response, or the antibody response at least, uh, with increasing time after infection, which of course makes... Makes perfect sense. Yeah, this is how an <coughs> antibody response works. This, um, those and, immunologists and, were not wrong. This, this is exactly you know what we would think of uh, yeah. that should happen with this these responses, and this timing makes sense as well. So now they say, okay, so these samples that we already sequenced, it was before there was a, much of an antibody response, so there's no pressure. So probably that's why we're not seeing much happening, right? So they have one. Uh, patient where they have enough samples where they can do sequencing and antibody profiling and see uh, if there's a relationship. And this is, this is very cool. I mean, for, listen to this. So in this patient one, between days nine and 13, the RNA goes down by four orders of magnitude. Okay. From, from a million to, you know, 10 to the six to 10 to the two. Then, however, on day 15, it goes back up again. And then on day 17, it goes back down. So you think, oh, you get infected, it goes up, it peaks, and then it just goes down. It's a little more heterogeneous than that. And then they say, um, this pattern is associated with the emergence of two haplotypes on day 11 and four minor haplotypes on day 15. So it's just a correlation, right? You see these things going up and down, and that happens to be haplotypes that are uh, associated with that. Uh, these variants have three independent non-synonymous changes within a single epitope of the N-terminal domain. And they tell us what the amino acid change is. Uh, and then after, on day 13, where there was a low uh, RNA load, uh, they only found uh, the consensus variant. On day 15, there were deletions of a certain number of amino acids or uh, a single amino acid uh, in this epitope. Uh, and this accounts for like 20, 26% of the genomes on day 15. Where are these changes in the spike? They are in a, what they call a super site of vulnerability. And I, I keep wanting to think of Superfund for some reason. Yes. <laughs> you remember Superfunds? <laughs> oh, oh there, yeah, that's yeah. still a thing. Yeah. Still a thing, yeah. Super site of vulnerability. Lots in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we have a lot. Oh, I, I, I drive by this uh, place. So it used to be this old factory, huge, right? And then one day it was all gone and there was asphalt. It's like 10 acres of asphalt. And it has a big sign, super fun site, because it obviously was toxic as hell. And they just put asphalt on top of it <laughs> to okay. cover it up. Can you imagine what they were making and just throwing out there? Anyway, they then they sample it for a long time. 
So it turns out that this super site of vulnerability is the epitope of a, a known neutralizing antibody 4A8 and mutations, uh, amino acid changes at that epitope have been found in other, in persistent infect, infections in patients. Um, so it turns out that this, um, the, the N-terminal domain mutations, right, amino acid changes um, uh, had, had occurred in other samples that they have as well. So in other words, what we're seeing is we have uh, development of antibodies in the serum, changes in their specificity, and then the emergence of particular haplotypes or particular amino acid changes in the areas um, that are targeted by this antibody, right? So the, you know, when the titer goes down, I suppose that the antibody is reducing the viral load. And then a variant is in there that's not neutralized, so it comes back up again, right? Yeah. So so basically the virus replicates, goes up to that high peak level, then the immune response starts to bring it down as we kind of classically imagine. But then we have some variant that has the ability to evade that immune response at least a bit. And now the virus is able to start reproducing a little bit more at a higher level and sort of get around that, that immune response. And so we kind of have this back and forth battle of who's winning. Right. And then the immune response comes back on the other side, broadens its response more and tamps the virus back. Exactly. Down. And, you know, the outcome, we don't know. It depends on the individual patient, right? You may imagine that a particular variant might emerge that that patient will, will dominate and maybe transmit to someone else, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how these variants that are more resistant to antibodies emerge. But we didn't know this before. We, we had no clue. And they say that we had not seen this before. And they say it may have been overlooked in part due to the emphasis on tracking new mutations on a global scale, right, rather than in individual patients, um, with a predominance of cross-sectional rather than longitudinal analysis, right? So we just get one sample from a lot of people as opposed to many timed samples from right. fewer. And they also say that, you know, when you take samples from people, you, tip, you typically use the ones that have good quality sequence, which they say probably early in infection, there's a lot of RNA being produced and it's going to give you the best sequence. So we're biasing it to before the antibodies have kicked in, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And it, where the titers are, are dropping. So I think it's very cool. Um, now, of course, the sequencing method too is totally different, right? Single genomes, which yeah. shows you a, a level of detail you wouldn't see by the other consensus sequences. So I think this is cool. I, I mean, it, we'd like to see more than one patient, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. You, so, would let, you would love to see this in multiple patients, but it's certainly challenging enough to both get the samples and do all of this. Yes. Um, yeah, I've, and from different parts of the world. And I mean, maybe you can start to say, well, here, here are all the variants that, that are arising in people. We don't see most of them in the population maybe because they have less fitness or whatever. But I think that would give you an idea of how much of spikes they might be able to change because we don't really know that, right? Yeah. Because people- Yeah, are and I think it's safe to say that this is not something that the virus just figured out how to do last week, you know, in this paper. No. Uh, this has been yeah. going on through the entire pandemic. In every patient who gets infected, you get these variants coming out. Now you finally see what's going on with that dynamic. And as Vincent said, this is where the new variants that we do see in the population are gonna come from when they manage to get transmitted from somebody who's gone through this process of, of yeah. growing them. Yeah, and this is not also uh, unique to SARS-CoV-2. Oh no. Right. Um, there, there have been a number of situations where people have shown some kind of immune response um, and sequence and things like that for many other viruses. But usually that's pretty far into our knowledge of those viruses and aspects of what's going on. And so here we can, we're actually seeing it, you know, in real time uh, in those patients during yeah. this pandemic. I mean, we just never looked, right? So yeah. now we're looking and- And, and I think this thing of cool. studying the virus over time in the course of the infection is something that's very rarely been done in any, with any kind of a method in an acute virus. Right. You get one sample. Well, you know, patients over the virus by the time you've sequenced it. Um, whereas uh, something like HIV, we have a whole literature of studies where it's over the period of years that the patient is infected. You can see the changes in the virus and you can actually track individual lineages of virus from one person to another this yeah, way. Exactly. Every example I can think of 
is mean, HIV. Is or HIV. chronic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting because, you know, the, the sequencing really matured at the time, you know, around the 90s. And that was immediately applied to uh, HIV. And we were amazed at how much change was going on, right? We had no idea before that. But that's why, that's why I like this because um, it really examines in an individual patient changes, well, many changes that can occur and correlates it with antibody pressure, which I think is driving now the emergence of the variants. I think most of them are probably selected by antibody pressure in one way or another. And then they may have other phenotypic consequences as well. So there you go. Okay, now uh, we have a, another paper, a snippet really, which was suggested by Sue, who wrote most cherished TWIV team. <laughs> I'm in sunny Etruria and had some contact with Vincent over the translation of Christian Drosten's podcast early in the pandemic. I'm an assiduous listener of both. Infinite thanks for sharing with us all. I'm not sure you have any idea just what a gift this is to the rest of us. Please, can I beg you to take a look? Now, if you say, please, can I beg you? I, you know, what can I do? <laughs> take a look at this retrospective cohort study comparing CSVT incidents in the US, cerebral venous thrombosis, uh, after mRNA vaccination and after SARS-CoV-2 infection and discuss its implications. It has some uh, limitations admitted by the authors, but some important points seem to emerge. And she's, she summarizes them, but uh, we will go through the paper and, and summarize them ourselves. And then she has reasons for concern. The consequences of the insistent media-mediated denigration of AstraZeneca have really been serious in Europe. I have access to the domestic TV channels of France, Germany, and Italy, and have followed with increasing horror the devastating effect of this on the already poor vaccine rollout in these countries. People are refusing AstraZeneca and often leaving the centers without a vaccination. In some German regions, they even had the bright idea of giving people a choice <laughs> with predictable consequences. I've been puzzling over this whole affair since the beginning. So much made no sense at all. One thing missing all the time was any reference to vaccine other than AZ until now with J&J. &J. I noticed there was never an evidence-based official statement that these events were definitely not happening with the mRNA platform. Yes, I am aware of the association of TT with specific um, adenovirus vectors in the past in a different medical context. Also with all the uncertainty around such rare events, how to justify the effective destruction of the reputation of a currently vital vaccine outside the US. And uh, she gave a link to this paper, which we'll talk about. The above, this study is reporting with whatever caveats an incidence of four per million for the mRNA vaccines. This is a rate very close to what's been reported for AZ and which led to the pausing rollouts in the middle of a raging pandemic and in a context of a paucity of vaccine supply. This has inevitably led to death and misery in Europe and possibly elsewhere. Please, please, could you air this matter and maybe throw some light on it? I can't emphasize enough that the whole affair is actually costing lives in Europe. In infinite gratitude anyway, wish I could send you some olive, uh, some oil from our olives, but it would never get there. <laughs> Sounds delicious. Uh, so the manuscript, it's a preprint, Cerebral venous thrombosis, a retrospective cohort study of 513,284 confirmed COVID-19 cases in a comparison with 489,871 people receiving a COVID-19 mRNA vaccine by Takei Hussein Geddes, Luciano, and Harrison from the University of Oxford uh, and in a hospital and a company in Cambridge and Oxford as well. So this is a health records network analysis, right? You go into the health records, you get permission to do that, and you uh, see what you can find. And um, you know, at the begin, at the onset, you know the the uh, the risk of this um, event, and it's cerebral venous thrombosis, which appears to be triggered in perhaps in certain people immunized with the. AstraZeneca and now the J and J vaccine. Uh, it, for for the Chadox, it was five five per million estimated, and we've talked about it. It's called a vaccine induced thrombocyte, thrombotic thrombocytopenia (VITT). And if I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong. So the idea is that 
the vaccination somehow is inducing uh, antibodies to platelet factor four, which then triggers uh, clotting similar to, to heparin dependent clotting, which somehow is binding to PT4 and the antibodies are, are interacting with that, right? Yeah. So that those data have been coming out somewhat more recently, and it looks like most of the people who have uh, the cerebral venous thrombosis happen to have these antibodies against platelet factor four. Um, and so how exactly one is uh, getting antibodies uh, against platelet factor four as a result of all mm. of this is not particularly clear or certain. Um, there are a couple of arguments I've heard, but nothing that's really so it resembles, know, a clear mechanism. So it resembles what we call heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, right? So, mm -hmm. and let me tell you, I found a nice description. This occurs when heparin-dependent IgG antibodies bind to the heparin platelet factor four complexes. They activate the pla platelets and produce a coagulable state. We don't know the cause of this. Uh, the rapid production of these antibodies with four days without initial IgM production suggests a secondary immune response despite the absence of previous heparin use in most patients who develop HIT. Uh, based on these observations, it's sens hypothesized that sensitization of the anti-heparin platelet factor four antibody occurs as a result of exposures to other environmental factors like bacterial infection. So similar thing is happening here. Somehow you, these antibodies are being produced that are binding to platelet factor four. And, and I, I guess I would realistically want to ask Daniel this question. Yeah. Um, but I think part of the reason why this is important is that um, typically you might treat someone with a type of thrombosis with heparin, but in these cases, it would be really bad to treat yes. with heparin. Yeah. And so you need to make sure that you're treating these, you're recognizing this as a unique thrombosis and treating it differently than you might treat other. That was, that was a major part of the discussion around the pause, um, was that they they wanted to stop the delivering this vaccine for a moment. Um, and also let all the physicians know if you have any patients with this, don't give them heparin because we think this may be what's going on. Um, and then sort that out from there. Yeah. I, th I think not all of these patients had received heparin. Um, right. At all. And so uh, here's what Daniel told me. Um, it does, it's complicated. The rare CVST with thrombocytopenia looked to be three to 15 times more common with the J&J &J than expected. To date in the U.S., uh, there have been zero CVSTs post Pfizer and three after Moderna, but never with low platelets. Now, if you say, what about just clots in general? Then yes, they are common all around, seen in people who got vaccinated and not, and not increased by vaccination in general. Also, clotting with natural disease is very common and getting COVID-19 significantly increases your clotting risk about tenfold over baseline, which is what we're going to see here. So what the, all right. So they do an electronic health records assessment. Um, what they do is they have uh, patients who had confirmed COVID between January 2020 and March uh, 2021. And they identified patients who had the diagnosis uh, of CVT in, in the two weeks following their diagnosis of COVID-19, right? And um, then they also identified patients with high D-dimer, uh, low fibrinogen, thrombocytopenia, which would be, be indications of of clotting, right, to, to try and make a correlation. And then they had two control cohorts for comparison of people who had an influenza diagnosis between the same time and also people, and they call this a control, it's interesting, the first dose of the two mRNA vaccines, uh, be the Pfizer and the and Moderna. This is mainly a U.S. study. Um, yeah, so that's the, the way they did it, and they, they analyzed the data and... Um, by statistical procedures. So here they found 513 patients with confirmed COVID, 54% females, um, age, average age 46. Of these 20 were diagnosed with a CVT in the two weeks following their diagnosis. So these are people just with COVID. Right. That's There's an, five, 513,000 people with COVID. And yeah. yeah 20 this. had a CVT. That risk is 39 per million. And uh, it's higher in patients with a history of cardiovascular diseases and specific kinds. 
Um, among these 20 events, six were in patients under 30, four between 30 and 39, two 40 to 49, two 50 to 59, three 60 to 69, and three 70 to 79. It's a little so broader. pretty spread out. But a little yeah, broader than the vaccine associated with the J&J, &J, right? Yeah, one thing that they I don't see here is if there are differences uh, between the sexes, uh, because I right. know there's been some question about yeah. uh, some of these cases being in women. And so yeah. I'd be interested to know um, if there were differences there. Yeah, in fact, with the J&J, &J, I believe all the cases have been in women. Yes. Which could actually, if we go back to using it, could actually be a really easy way to prevent this from happening. Is <laughs> You know, if you're female, you don't get that vaccine. Um, right. I thought there was one man, man with a- Was there? I thought I, there was. I, yeah. I feel like we talked about this on Tuesday and someone mentioned that they had read something about there having been one man, but I hadn't okay. seen that. Yes, here it is in the in the Times, actually. One man okay. had a clot. Um, All right, forget that then. Uh, so if actually, if you look at the, the table, they do have uh, female versus male in the table. Ah. Oh, so the- Oh yeah, here we go. So now we have uh, an update on Tuesday, okay? So we have seven women and one man who got it during the trial, actually, not oh. after the trial. Hmm. All right, so... Um, so it looks like with the, um, the, out of those 20 patients, 12 were female and eight were male. Eight were male. All right, so influenza, their control, uh, zero. No, no CVT um, and people who had influenza, right? And then the mRNA vaccine, four per million. Uh, two, two cases were observed in the mRNA vaccine group, one after the Pfizer and one they didn't know if it was Pfizer or, mRNA or Moderna. Um, so... The Chadox vaccine is is 169 cases out of 34 million people. That's five per million. The historical incidence of CVT in the U.S. 13 to 20 per million per year. So this this happens outside of. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if these people had other illnesses or whatever. Right? It's hard to say. Yeah, they did do. They they looked at comorbidities, but it's spread out. Yeah, it's. Um, there's no obvious correlation there. They also looked at a different kind of thrombosis, portal vein thrombosis. Uh, COVID patients, four, 436 per million, much higher. Uh, influenza, 98 per million. V mRNA vaccine, 44 per million. Uh, and then that group, 22 cases in the mRNA vaccine, 11 Pfizer, 2 Moderna, and the other nine, they don't know which vaccine they got. And some laboratory data, as I said, suggests that patients with CVT after COVID were more likely to have elevated D-dimer than patients with COVID who did not have CVT, All right? And that's, a, that's an indicator of this condition. So there is an increased rate of CVT in COVID patients, but they say all the risks should be interpreted with caution. They say first the Risk versus the population baseline or versus flu is not based on cohorts that were matched for age or other demographic factors. So we can't conclude that the mRNA vaccines here are associated with an increased risk. We need larger samples. And in fact, this has been bandied about in the press, right? Jay and Jay said, oh, it was associated with mRNA. And Paul Offit said, you can't say that. And this is why, because right. the sample is too small. Uh, secondly, no information about diagnostic accuracy or completeness. Completeness. That's that could be an issue, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that there have been some arguments that are are being made that some of the kind of baseline numbers that we quote here for comparison's sake, yeah, um, might be not the right baseline numbers because maybe we should be looking at only a very specific type of diagnosis or only diagnosis in certain subgroups of people or something like that. And so the the background rate sometimes that people are quoted is in the general population and for kind of these uh, events uh, somewhat more broadly than yeah. maybe happening. And unfortunately, uh, again, as not an MD, um, that's about as well as I can interpret some of those arguments. Yeah. 
Um, third, the absence of key hematological lab data limits our ability to say whether the CVT after COVID is similar or different from CHADOX, right? Uh, so we, I mean, especially about these antiplatelet four antibodies. Yeah, we don't have any of that data for the uh, CVT after COVID. And then say finally, we can't directly compare the risks of CVT associated with um, CHADOX with any of the vaccines or with COVID since we are using data collected by this monitoring system. It's actually not from the electronic health records network. And in fact, they can't even compare uh, CHADOX because nobody in the U.S. gets CHADOX, right? Right. <laughs> right. So I mean, it, it does seem like COVID gives you a higher risk of clotting yes. than do any of the other things that yes. they're looking at here. Yes. That, that I think we can take. COVID can take is the worst this. thing you can get if you're if you're worried about clots out of the set yeah. of things they, they looked at in this paper. I think yes. that's the point. Whether it's the same or different, it's a blood, it's a brain clot, and that's not good either way, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, they say. You know, it's a tentative conclusion, but we wanted to publish this to contextualize and inform the debate about the risk-benefit ratio. So, as we've just said, the risk of clots is very much higher than COVID, no matter what the mechanism. So, and that's why in, in the European Medicines Agency has said, we think the, this vaccine should be used. The risk of COVID is worse than the vaccine. And yep. in fact, today, as we're doing this, the, this committee is meeting, the ACIP is meeting, right, in the U.S. to decide what to do about the J&J. So we'll see what they. I have a feeling they'll say um, maybe avoids you know people of a certain age. Um, I don't know because yeah they may they may say I mean the easy thing to do would be as I said don't give it to women of childbearing age would be the that's going to be the vast majority of the cases we've seen so far of the seven you know and other than that it um, even if you include that group the benefits still far outweigh the risks. Right. And and you can also imagine that physicians might get some different uh, guidelines in terms of what to do if they see this in their yes. patient. Yeah, I, I heard a quote from a physician here. He said, you know, we can treat these things if we can pick them up early enough, right? Um, I mean, a clot in the brain is not good. If you get a headache, that's, you know, immediately you have to go. If you got a vaccine and you got a headache, boom, <laughs> go to the ER and tell them. Uh, but uh, fortunately, a number of these people have died. No, no, no. In Europe, Tell right? them and then go to the ER. Call in first. Yeah, yeah, you should. You I, I think I generally, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Call your doctor. Oh, your doctor, not the ER, though. No, they're not going to. Yeah. They're not going to answer your call. I assume. I assume. <laughs> um, so it's a story. I don't. I we'll, we'll know more next week. Or yeah. Later today, and, but and the usual asterisk on preprints, and I think the authors actually did a pretty good job laying out the the reservations in this. Apart yeah. from that, you know, in the U.S., as Daniel said last week, the J and J is not a huge fraction of people immunized, right, compared to the right. mRNA vaccines. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to. This this is a lot of this vaccine, and it could benefit other countries. And I don't mean to but, say that we're going to give other countries a bad vaccine, but if it's not a bad vaccine. It's not a bad no, vaccine, it's, right? It's a great vaccine, and it's a vaccine that has a lot of pros. Yeah. The vaccine that has a lot of things in its favor. Um, and so we want to make sure that people are not thinking it's a bad vaccine or being worried about getting this vaccine and understand that it's still a great vaccine. Yeah. All right, Alan, let's do some email. Alan, can you take the first one? Sure. Um let me just scroll down to it. So Charles writes, hello, Twivers. Wonderful day for a hike in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 68 Fahrenheit, 20 C with low humidity. A great time to listen to Twiv and think. Today's thoughts turn to the J&J &J vaccine and the media reporting about the risk. The media has been using six cases for the numerator and 6.8 million as the denominator. I have no problem with the six cases, but the 6.8 million is way off. First adjustment, with the 6 to 13 day delay, 21 if you look at the FDA news release, between injection and symptom onset, we need to go back in time or wait a bit longer. Going back to April 1, the number of injections was around 4 million. Uh, I think we've actually now adjusted for, just about adjusted for this time frame. Um, second adjustment, thanks to Dr. Rackin Yellow for this one and the next. All six of the patients with cerebral venous sinus thr thrombosis, uh, CVST, were female. 54.4% of those vaccinated in the U.S. have been female. 
Applying that to the 4 million knocks the denominator down to 2.2 million. Third adjustment, the six patients were between 18 and 48. Uh, I could find data that broke out 18 to 49, so that's what I'm going to use. And then says the percentage of that is 37.6%. This is not really fair because the J&J &J vaccine came later after a lot of older people had already received a different vaccine. I'm going to, uh, a wild ass guess, 50% uh, that knocks the denominator down to 1.1 million. I come up with about one in 183,000 cases per person at risk. This is still very rare, but a far cry from the over one in a million chance the media has reported. There are about 59.5 million females between 18 and 49 in the U.S. That works out to about 325 cases of CVSD for the country if every vulnerable person, female 18 to 49, is vaccinated. And I'll just add, with this vaccine, and this is the numbers hold up. Um, I don't want to minimize the tragedy for the 325 people, their family and friends, but that is far fewer than those killed by COVID-19. Looking just at the 18 to 29 year old people, 1,957 had died of COVID-19 as of March 31st, 2021. 32 people 18 to 24 died on um, April 15th, 2021, lowest point over a year. My gut tells me that if I was a young woman, I would hold out for an mRNA vaccine. My brain tells me if I was going to take more than two weeks, go for whatever vaccine I can get today. If the J&J &J vaccine was the only one available, the time I would need to decide to take to take it would be way less than 0.68 seconds after seeing the data. <laughs> Bottom line, don't miss a chance to get your shot. And uh, P.S., this is the last of my TWIV binge emails for today. I hope I did not go over my limit, I guess. <laughs> sent some others. So the, uh, what's the COVID? The risk after COVID is 39 point per million, right? Right. That's mm -hmm. what we just said. So this is about five per million? Yeah, it would be a little more than five per million. And he notes, you know, this works out to 325 cases of CVST um, and says, you know, that could, would be a tragedy for these people. But that's how many of them would be diagnosed with these clots, which we just noted yeah. are can be treatable if they're caught early. Yeah. And um, I just want to point out in this um, this mathematical analysis, the problem here is going into this, we didn't know that there was an identifiable subgroup because we didn't know of the existence of this possible complication. Yeah, that's right. And so when you say, okay, it's only affecting women 18 to 48, um, yeah, it appears that way now, except for the one guy in the trial. Um, mm -hmm. so, but I, I, I would, uh, I would actually defend the one in a million statistics because that is the number of people, number of people, cause that's the group you're vaccinating who actually had this outcome and appeared to be associated with the vaccine. Well, in the end, Charles would do it. So that's the bottom line, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brienne. Sure. Anna writes, howdy Twivers. I am writing to tell you how much I appreciated the talk you had with Dr. Nadine Lemberski. I am a Brazilian poultry veterinarian that doesn't appreciate being a clinician as much as being a researcher. <laughs> I was first introduced to TWIV in 2011 when you went to Brazil and recorded an episode from a virology conference held in Atibaia, Sao Paulo. Flash forward four years, I moved to California to go to grad school at UC Davis. I was there for four years for my PhD, plus one year doing a residency in poultry medicine. I am now living in Calgary, Canada, while still working at UCD as a researcher remotely. Let's see how long my boss will appreciate my work from a distance, given I am not in Davis to help the rest of the lab clean chicken poop from our experimental units. <laughs> My PhD research was on infectious bronchitis virus, a gamma coronavirus of chickens, and the immune responses elicited after challenge experiments with IBV. Infections with IBV are often local, affecting the upper respiratory tract, mostly tracheas. High systemic levels of anti-IBV IgG, or IgY, does not correspond to protection. It seems protection is more likely to occur when high levels of local IgA and IgG are present, generally measured in tears or tracheal washes. I am now trying to imagine measuring tears of a chicken. Chicken tears, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it also seems that cell-mediated immunity in capital letters <laughs> plays a major role in protection, especially CD8 T cells. I was so thrilled to hear episode 736 with Dr. Alessandro Sete. T cells are bomb and so underrated. <laughs> You'll like my pick then. Um, anyway, I just wanted to point out that we have been dealing with infectious bronchitis in the field for several years. 
It's an endemic disease and we use live attenuated vaccines, which speed up virus evolution since we have wild type strains and vaccine strains interacting, often resulting in mRNA recombination Mm. in addition to the point mutations that occur during viral replication. Our issue with IBV in poultry isn't going anywhere. Us poultry vets just try to control IBV the best way we can and choose our live vaccines carefully to avoid introducing a bigger problem than the original one. Dr. Lamberski was spot on when she said vets wouldn't have let this COVID madness happen if they were in charge. Vaccines are no miracle makers. People who work with production animals know that if you don't have a solid biosecurity program, the vaccines don't have the expected effect on the flock or the herd. Hard to see a light at the end of the tunnel when you see people, for instance, in my country, Brazil, having parties, traveling, and acting like nothing is happening while there are 4,000 people dying of COVID every day. It warms my heart listening to you. It reminds me of why my scientist side speaks louder than anything else, despite the frustrations that the job entails. Keep up the good work. All the best, Anna. Hmm. I'd like to know more about IBV and chickens. That sounds interesting. Yeah, it does. I like the T cells. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this Brazil situation, I mean, she puts it, that's what's happening. People say, what's going on in Brazil? You know, scary. No, it's not scary. People are misbehaving, right? I mean, it is yeah. scary, but it's not mysterious. Well, yeah, it's not, they're, they're worried. Is there a scary variant that is causing this? No, it's this? not the virus that's causing that. <laughs> no, it's well, everyone's tired it's of- It's the people. <laughs> well, the virus is causing the death, but it's not a well, particular yes, variant. It's, yes, yeah. Yeah, the people are out and about. Wherever there's spikes, it's people are out and about. Um, the next one spikes is- of pe- Spikes of people lead to spikes of virus. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> I like this title, T-cells are the bomb. Too bad we, we have to remember that we ever do a it's T-cell for, episode. For an episode where we're talking about that, yeah. Um, the next one is from John, Dr. Twiv. After being sacked by the odious right-wing owners from Toledo of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Pulitzer Prize-winning cartoonist Rob Rogers' work is now available only to his patrons, of which I am one. But I think with this link, you'll be able to see it. And if this qualifies for a reader pick, consider it submitted. Uh, And then he wrote to say the link was taken down, but he sent the cartoon, (laughs) which is... um, a picture of a vial of J&J COVID vaccine, and it says, paused after six cases of rare blood clots. And then the next panel is a picture of a machine gun and a hand pistol. And it says, not paused despite 147 mass shootings so far in 2021. And so the, he was he was sacked <laughs> from the, from the uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I don't know if because yep. of this or before. Do you know anything? I think it was must have been before this because um, this is something that was on the cartoonist's uh, Patreon private fe- uh, Patreon yeah. feed. Also, by the way, an old college pal who became a veterinarian near Philly and who has far less joy after the death of his wife from cancer a couple of years ago was immensely cheered by the Nadine Lambersky Nadine Lambersky podcast. Very good, thank you. I'm glad you were. Oh. Best regards, John. Uh, Alan. Uh, Randy writes, hello, wonderful TWIV team. My wife and I discovered TWIV this past year, and it has brought us together for a common interest like almost nothing else ever has. Neither of us are scientists, but we both have technical degrees and backgrounds, so maybe it's just the nerd in both of us. Regardless, thank you. I'm just writing to tease Kathy about her seeming lack of knowledge of Michigan's land-grant college, which you all discussed in TWIV 746. As a Michigan nerd myself and a lifelong Wolverine, go blue, I try to conveniently misremember anything that has to do with Michigan State. Anything good. Anything anything good. (laughs) Yes. But I do need to inform Kathy and you all that Michigan State is Michigan's land-grant university. When I was growing up, my dad used to laugh and call Michigan State Moo You, which to this day still (laughs) makes me laugh and something I tease my Spartan graduate brother about. All the best to everyone. Randy, who's now in Atlanta, where it's currently 58 Fahrenheit and 14C. No competition there, eh? Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. Anytime, it, pretty much in every state where you have a university of state and a state university, mm-hmm. they will be bitter enemies. <laughs> uh, Brianne, do you have any competition, Drew, with anybody else? Drew, uh, you know, we we sometimes will say a few little things about Fairleigh Dickinson down the road, but nothing. Uh, oh, right, right. Nothing nearly at the same level um, <laughs> as what you see with Michigan and Michigan State or some other 
a major university. Michigan, Michigan State is like a Texas A&M UT yeah. type of um, rivalry. So you have University of Massachusetts and a bunch of them, right? And then, yeah, it's just a bunch of University of Massachusetts. We don't, don't have you um, don't have Massachusetts State. No, no, it's neither, uh, neither we, do we in New Jersey. We don't have it's either. too it's too snobbish and uptight and eastern here to uh, <laughs> yeah, have that no. kind of. Brawl. Yeah, we just have Rutgers. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's the state university, right. right? Right. Yeah, but I bet people at Princeton make fun of Rutgers, right? I'm sure they must. <laughs> they make fun of everyone. Right? <laughs> I I don't know any colleges where no one makes fun of anyone else. <laughs> no, that's yeah. Just, yeah, that doesn't happen. There's always somebody you pick on. Yeah. Uh, Brienne, you're next. Cheryl writes, a colleague of mine says she wasn't encouraging her adult son, 20, to be vaccinated because he showed, quote, showed her evidence from Johns Hopkins that said the vaccine could cause male infertility, end quote. I've looked for hours and the only reliable sources I've found state there is a risk from contracting the virus, not getting the vaccine, aside from a drop in sperm motility associated with fever. Please clear this up for me as I want to make sure I have accurate facts to share with my colleagues. Thanks. You, thank you to you for all to you all for this invaluable podcast, Cheryl. Um, and Cheryl ends with a quote from Confucius, our greatest glory is not in never falling, but rising every time we fall. Uh, Cheryl, I have not heard anything about this. This is, this sounds an awful lot like the son saw something forwarded on Facebook from a doctor at Johns Hopkins who makes some weird allegation. And that is not evidence of anything except the son's gullibility and it's unfortunate that the that his mother is going along with this um I, if you're i mean if you're not sophisticated about the science and you see something like this and it looks credible i guess it might seem persuasive but that is absolutely there's no evidence of that so I found a statement by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine joint statement regarding covid vaccine in men um, from a bunch of societies. There are no data about the impact of the vaccine on male or female fertility. For women, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends pregnant and lactating women be offered the vaccine. And, and Daniel said it just, a study has just shown that it's safe. Uh, mRNA vaccine is safe in pregnant women. Uh, similarly, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine has recommended pregnant women have access. Finally, the American Society for reproductive medicine does not re recommend holding va withholding vaccine for patients who are planning to conceive. For men, uh, we recommend the COVID vaccine should not be withheld and they should be offered to men desiring fertility, similar to men not desiring fertility <laughs> when they meet <laughs> criteria for vaccination. It should be noted that about 16% of men in the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine trial experienced fever after the second dose. Fevers can cause temporary declines in sperm production. Thus, if a man experiences fever as a result of the vaccine, he may experience a temporary decline in sperm production, but that would be similar to or less than if the individual experienced fever from developing COVID or for other reasons. Maybe that's what got out there, that the fever and blah, 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 right? Yeah. I mean, usually these things are put together from little bits and scraps of half-truths that are unrelated yeah. and and make it sound credible and it's just complete BS. And the, I, this circulate, this is a common trope that's used in anti-vaccination yeah. propaganda that, oh, it's going to affect fertility. You know, it's just a standard target that a lot of people will value enough that you can, you can say, oh, it'll make you infertile. And every time I hear something like that, whether it's being promulgated about polio vaccine in Africa, which was something that was going on for a while, there were clerics saying it'll make you sterile. Um, and now the COVID-19 vaccine, I know these things have been circulating. And, and every time I hear one of these, I think, my God, if only birth control was that easy. Right. I mean, come on. This is a really tough problem to affect fertility with a, with yeah. a yeah. microliter injection of some thing that's going <laughs> to disappear. It doesn't work that way. That's especially not for men. Yes, but you know what they would say to you, Alan, but how do you know? <laughs> right? That's the answer. Right. Of course. Yeah. So the, the female fertility came about because 
you know, there are a few amino acids similar between spike and syncytia, syncytium, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the placental pro protein you need right. for syncytial trophoblast fusion. And but it's, it's something like a string of three or four yeah. amino acids. And so someone said somewhere, oh, this could mean you could make antibodies to that and it would inhibit placental formation. So it was just a speculation and somehow it got out as it's going to, it does <laughs> prevent. Right. I mean, that's how this works, as you've said. Yes. Uh, there's yeah, no I, data to support that whatsoever, right? I, I pointed out to a lot of people that if you actually look at my writing and Shakespeare's writing, there are places where we put four of the same letters in a row. <laughs> um, and that does not mean anything about the quality of my writing <laughs> um, and whether you are going to mistake it for Shakespeare. Yes. Uh, and that usually makes the point pretty well. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Well, then you've said before that if you give a uh, non-human private a typewriter, eventually it'll knock out yes, four, it'll four write words. all the works mm -hmm. of Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, Felix writes, Feli writes, hi to have team. It's been more than a year since I started listening to y'all. The pandemic has been a wild ride so far, but thanks to your help, I've been able to keep myself sane and the people around me safe. Anyways, on to the topic. I live in Chile. Here we started vaccinating people at the beginning of February, starting from the most at-risk populations, retired folks, healthcare personnel, people with comorbidities, etc., and continuing down the priority list. Now we're vaccinating the general population at or above 48 years of age. Kudos to everyone involved for it's been a major challenge to do this campaign in an orderly fashion. We've been using Sinovac's Coronavac vaccine for about 90% of the patients, reserving the few Pfizer doses we have for immunocompromised folks. Coronavac is an inactivated virion vaccine, and therefore the expected effectiveness is lower than Pfizer's. However, since Sinovac's phase three trials weren't the most consistent, the exact effectiveness isn't as well understood as it is for the Pfizer vaccine. This is why the Ministry of Health has released the results of a cohort phase four study based on the observed versus expected outcomes in the immunized patients so far. The study has been huge, at least for me, to understand what we're talking about. I'm linking the English version of the press release at the end of this email. They will be updating it monthly. If anything major comes up, I'll be sure to notify y'all. Thank you for your continued work. What, what you do is akin to public libraries and road luminaries. It's stuff that's not sellable per se, even though it can have huge positive effects for everyone involved. Thanks. It truly makes a difference. Feli. All right. So anybody take a look at this? Let's see. Dro I'm Ooh, looking at it right now. It's a Dropbox um, link. Cool. Top line, they're claiming 89% effectiveness in preventing ICU admissions. Now, who is this press release from? The um, Ministry of Health in Chile. Oh, okay. Just yeah. got good. All right. So can you remind me, did we, is this the one where the Chinese uh, CDC guy said it was 50% effective? I I haven't kept track of the Chinese I vaccines. Thought, I, I think it is. There yeah, I think are two, right? right? It's Sinovac, uh, yeah, Coronavac, and the other is an adenovirus vectored one. Yeah. Right. Uh, Coronavac. Let's just check it out. I think so. I think uh, George Gao came on a couple of weeks ago saying it's 50 some odd percent. Right. But, um, was this the one he was talking about? The latest results for China's Coronavac developed by Sinovac. Yeah. 50%, right. There it's crappy. Um, but, may, but, in, but in Chile, it's better apparently, right? Because we're talking well, about the same vaccine. Are we talking about the same endpoint? Yeah, it's COVID. So the COVID, ch preventing COVID, yeah. Preventing symptomatic illness. So yeah. the eighty-nine percent is preventing ICU admissions. Um, and I'm tr okay. I'm drilling down through this to find. Okay, so here's a nice um, article from the Economist, which mentions George Gao. In clinical and real-world trials, China's Sinovac underperforms. So it's a typical economist headline, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's very different in. Um, uh, okay, so here we are. Here we are in the press press release from Chile. Mm -hmm. um, 
their Ministry of Health director says the effectiveness of CoronaVac, this is the Sinovac vaccine, 14 days after the second dose, is 67% to prevent COVID-19 symptoms. This is from Chile, sorry? This is from Chile, okay. 67% okay. against symptomatic. All right, and um, in China and it was 85, 50. 85% to prevent hospital admissions, 89% pre prevent admission to ICU. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, yeah, so in your Economist article that you've yeah. that you've linked, it says that the fifty percent was uh, against symptomatic COVID cases. Okay. Yeah. All right, so it's done a little better in Chile. So it's done sixty-seven percent in Chile. Yeah, and that's what they're using. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the um, the document, Feli, uh, and that brings us back to Alan. Okay. Ali writes, Dear Team Twiv, my mother-in-law sent the family an article about an Israeli company, Sanotize um, nit Nitric Oxide Nasal Spray, N-O-N-S. Despite my obsession with all things virology and Twiv, I'm far from being a scientist. Is this new nasal spray as good as it sounds? If so, can you explain how this treatment might fit into the global fight against SARS-CoV-2? Uh, linked, uh, here's a link to the press release of Sanotize and mm -hmm. an article from the Times of Israel. Thank you for all you do to keep us informed. I don't see the link didn't make it in, but Ali says, uh, from a, sunning, a stunning spring day in Portland, Oregon, with a high of 78 Fahrenheit, 45 C. Um, oh, yeah. I don't I'll think the, 78 Fahrenheit is 45 C, but... Here's, um, the tr here's the press release. Oh, there's the... Okay. So UK clinical trial confirms Sanitize's breakthrough treatment. Let's see. Um, phase two trial that evaluated 79 confirmed cases. Early treatment for significantly reduced the level of SARS-CoV-2, including in patients with high viral load. The average log reduction in the first 24 hours was 1.362, which corresponds to 95%. Within 72 hours, the viral load dropped by 99%. So they're just looking at viral load in these patients, in 79 patients. What it is, it's a nasal spray that has nitric oxide in it. And I just, I'm, I'm surprised that it's sustained, right? Because anything you spray in your nose tends to go away after not too long, right? Yeah. Okay, I, a couple of things occur to me immediately with this. First of all, when they say viral load, I assume they're talking about PCR. Yeah. Yeah, sure. CT counts. So sure. reduction in viral load is just CT count on PCR. This doesn't tell us anything about infectious virus. But the 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 thing I'm wondering is how are they looking and how often is this being dosed? Because if you shoot nitric oxide up your nose and then sample for mRNA, I'm not terribly surprised that you find less mRNA. Yeah, they, right? there's no details here, so we don't know. I yeah. I yeah, I it's nice that they claim they're doing a phase two clinical trial. Um you don't actually get efficacy data out of a clinical out of a phase two uh, in yeah, I I would need to see more on this. I'd need to see some published so, data um, on this. This is not actually nitric oxide, but it's a precursor that is metabolized and it releases nitric oxide. Okay. It's kind of the same thing you give patients for um, heart disease, right? You give okay. them a, nit nit an, um, a nitric nitrate. Yeah, nitroglycerin or other compounds that release um, right. nitric, a nitrate or whatever. Yeah. Uh, my wife would, if, good thing she doesn't listen because she worked for a company that made one of these things that is used to treat heart disease and the nitric oxide or nitrate, I don't know what the molecule is, um, is very effective at re repairing heart. And so this is a similar thing. It's not actually nitric oxide, but there are no details in this tri trial. So we'll have to wait yeah. for them to publish it. But I don't know if it's a, if it's a one point reduction. I'm not sure what that means. You yeah. Know? It's just really hard to interpret what's being done here and what it means. And I, yeah, so if it 
you know, do you reduce the amount of mRNA for a day and then it comes back? Yeah. yeah. Or is it actually reduced over a longer period of time? Yeah. Are they, are they going on? taking it? They say they give time points of 48 hours and 72 hours, but are they still shooting it in every day? And, yeah. and what does this mean in terms of course of disease? And the other thing is, as has come up repeatedly, and especially in Daniel Griffin's um, discussions, uh, if you've got something that's antiviral, you're going to have to give that really, really early on, possibly when people are still pre-symptomatic in order to have any kind of an effect on the outcome because the late stage of the disease when people are going to the e and going to the ER and into the ICU, this isn't going to do anything because it's no longer about the virus at that point, really. Yeah. So, I mean, it would be great if this worked, but I mean, I want to know the the effect on clinical outcome, right? That's really yeah. right. the key. Yeah, not we just, have questions. <laughs> not just reduction in viral loads. Uh, so, but um, I'd heard about this before. Yeah. And it's too early to tell basically, yeah. right? Um, who read that? Alan? Yes. Brianne, you're next. Sure. Aaron writes, hi, TWIV team. I'm wondering if you'd seen this manuscript and what your thoughts are. My impression is that this is really low level evidence for vector borne <laughs> transmission of SARS CoV 2, but I'd love to hear your more detailed analysis of any useful points from this study and what the major red flags are. Thanks for your ongoing efforts. I've been a listener for years, so you're my go to virologists, Aaron. Um, and Aaron is, in fact, a hmm. uh, professor in a veterinary medicine school. So hopefully she liked the Nadine Limbersky uh, episode as well. Um, so the title, I haven't looked at this before, but the title is arthropod ectoparasites have potential to bind SARS-CoV-2 via ACE. So this turns out that, okay, so ectoparasites have ACE. So they did a modeling, you know, computer modeling study. And they said, um, yeah, maybe the virus would bind. They'd do any wet experiments. So I think this is almost meaningless. Remember the paper from PNAS? that we did, which modeled the ACE2 of all different kinds of animals and ranked them according to potentially yes. being infectable. And, the, and the, one of the lowest ones was mink. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think this is of any value whatsoever. No. So just because a virus can bind um, does not mean that the cell is actually going to be uh, permissive to viral replication. And they didn't even. And we don't tech. even know from this paper that yeah. the virus can bind yeah. right, these, exactly. these receptors. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I mean, th we were really harsh on the PNAS paper. <laughs> I mean, Amy, Amy was very harsh too. And um, I, this is just not. Don't no. And this thing, you know, this is why someone asked me the other night on the live stream why uh, could could the virus reproduce in uh, ticks? Said, no, it doesn't. It's not, they're not vectors. Um, I mean, could the virus reproduce in ticks? Does it? Does I, it? I, I don't know. Has anybody looked? Would any, it was, it, that's not how it gets around. I think it's probably not permissive, right? It's right. really, I'd be it's very hard to surprised. imagine that. And, yeah, I'd be you know, very surprised. Epidemiologically, I don't think there's any evidence for, you know, vector no. transmission at all. No. So, Yeah. I have been surprised. Um in a number of ways when talking to students that they don't understand that for vector borne transmission, the virus actually needs to reproduce in the vector. Yes. Um, sort of, you know, be go into the digestive tract to get into the salivary gland. Yep. It's not just that it sort of sticks around on the mouth parts. Um, and, and I think that once I point that out to students, they're like, oh, I understand so much more now. Yeah. So that that's a key point <laughs> to notice here. Yes. Yeah. As nasty yes. as mosquitoes are, they're actually very clean and they, they keep their mouth parts clean and they also don't feed on one person and fly immediately to another person and feed again because they yeah. can't actually fly after they feed. They're so <laughs> bloated that yes. they kind of flub off a little bit and they've got to digest. And well, female mosquitoes take blood meals and they go lay eggs, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they'll have a second blood meal, but they don't always because they die in 14 days, you know, so... I mean, obviously enough of them do take a second blood meal to transmit, but not every one. Right. You don't particularly like mosquitoes, do you, Alan? I hate mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah. Do they bite you? Uh, oh, sure. But I mean, I, I hate them for their their impact on global public health. They're just mm. 
Oh, I thought you hated them personally because they bother no, you. No, no. I, well, I, I dislike them when they're in the room. I really, yeah, I hate that that high pitched whine and then it stops. I don't even hear that. I, my my hearing is too bad. But you know, oh. there are many good mosquitoes. There are okay. So I'm I have hatred for very specific. I my it's species specific hatred for okay, mosquitoes. I, I don't really probably, care about right. the ones that don't bite humans. And you don't care yeah, about they the, just didn't bite me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do one more here from Lana. Bonjour, Team Twiv. First, a, and this is very funny. Uh, first, a big thank you for all your work. I have really appreciated your pandemic guidance as a veterinarian. Wow, it's like the third vet today, yeah. right? I have never, I never expected I would want to know so much about human coronaviruses. I'm glad I found your podcast. I've been meaning to share a case report <clears throat> that you and listeners may find interesting. And finally got the impetus after TWIV 745's veterinary discussion. So here's more veterinary themed virology to illustrate why we shouldn't feed COVID sick mink to the dogs. In TWIV 681, the team pondered what would be done with the millions of mink due for culling to reduce the COVID-2 variant spread in Denmark. In fact, there are already rules and guidelines for animal material disposal in such cases set out by the OIE and various food and agriculture orgs. While these might be considered very wasteful by some, ignored or incorrectly followed maybe by others, this case provides a link, demonstrates why they are important. In brief, carcasses of lambs, which had died from foot and mouth disease virus infection, were fed to nearby dogs. The dogs subsequently died of myocardial pathology associated with foot and mouth disease virus infection. This is extraordinary as FMD naturally affects cloven hoofed animals. You already knew that viruses can be extraordinary. <laughs> we should just not give them any additional opportunities to prove it. That's just great. Uh, I would also like uh, the chance to repeat for emphasis the importance of the One Health Initiative mentioned by your guest, Dr. Lambersky. The events of the last year have really emphasized to me the importance of scientific collaboration. We brainy apes can achieve such incredible things when we collaborate. We can make the world a healthier place for all creatures. Thank you, Twi Team Twiv, for being part of the inspiration and outreach from a calm, cool 17 C spring afternoon in the south of France. I should also add that, remember, the BSE uh, outbreak was caused by feeding sh sheep who died of scrapie to cows. Yes. Yep. We shouldn't do that. No. <laughs> P.S. Why Vincent should never try to castrate any cows. With your love of precise wording, I hope you'll appreciate this wee poke at your choice of words in 745 podcast, just as you can get grumpy with people confusing COVID-2 with the disease COVID-19. One of my personal peeves is people confounding cows and cattle. I guess people hear about cow farms or rather dairy farms and then assume there must be male and female animals there. However, cows are specifically adult female cattle. So please don't try to castrate any cows, not even try, nor even try to milk a bull. <laughs> this is vices for your own safety from your veterinary fans across the globe. Stay safe, everyone. Yes, I completely was an idiot. Yes. I said castrating but, but the that's, cows. In common usage, cow is often, is by by non-veterinarians. I'm sure I've done this before too. And, you know, this this will go on till the cows come home. I feel like a jerk for doing, saying castrate a cow though. I really do. I'm right. sorry. Um, it was a very- yeah, You would castrate a bull to get a steer. You would castrate a bull to get a steer. And they're all cattle right. or, or what? What is cattle? Cattle would be the yeah. collective term for the, the whole- a collection of animals of, of that bovines. species. <laughs> collection of bovines. Although if you have a herd that is exclusively steer being raised for beef, they can be referred to as beeves. Really? Yes. Um, B -E -E are you sure? B-E-E-V-E-S, yes. All right. So now let me ask another dumb question. Do we raise, we raise steer for, for meat, meat, right? Not the cows yeah. though. We don't eat them. Um, cows, old dairy cows, when they've reached the uh, dairy cow will go for 20 years producing milk. And it's one of the good things about milk production is that you keep the same cow. Um, but then eventually when they stop producing milk, they do get, um, slaughtered and, and I'm not, it, it would not be the best steak. Um, I think that may be mm -hmm. like low grade ground beef cause it's an old animal, um, but they do get slaughtered and the meat gets put into 
some food supply. Okay. Yeah, and that's the problem with BSE because cows can develop – not cows, sorry. Cattle. Cattle can develop um, sporadic BSE, which is not from eating uh, sheep, but rather just sporadic prion disease. And they're, they're slaughtered typically before – uh, you see the symptoms of the disease, um, and so a, ca a, a cow that wouldn't be an issue because you're not you're waiting 20 years before right. you're killing them for meat. But the male cows, no, the male cattle. Sorry, the male cattle. <laughs> <laughs> no male cows. Well, maybe there could be if you did a transgender, right? Right. Yeah. We but no, asked. you can't. Animals. Animals don't have gender. Gender is culturally sex, I mean. and psychologically Sorry, sex, determined. I mean. so, yeah, sex. you could sex change it, but they wouldn't. Yeah, nobody would do that. Anyway. Um, so the, it's the steer that are the issue, I guess, right. for, for the BSC. Yeah, that's why we need the test. Raised, yeah, they're raised and then slaughtered on a very short and so time. So that's why developing tests for pathogenic prions has been important because we don't test many of the steer. Yes. I'm just, I just wanted to say cows, you know, because, and I'm sure in my <laughs> prion lecture, I say cow all the time. It's very, very common. And, and I'm sure I've done it too. And I, I, on some level, I think I knew that that was not technically correct. But okay. Thank you. Um, Brian, can you read that last one there? Uh, it's, sure. it's an ad and I think we could get it out now. Yeah. Sure. Jennifer writes, hi, TWIB team. I wanted to share some postdoc opportunities that might be of interest to your listeners. The Precision Vaccines Program at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, are looking for postdoctoral scientists to join their team. The application information is attached and the Nature Careers posting can be found here. And she provides a link. Appreciate all you and the TWIB team do, particularly this last year. All the best, Jen. Actual virologist by training, Rio virus, then HPV. <laughs> I, I like actual as opposed actual to- Actual virologist, <laughs> yes. To a, 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 someone who's imposter, right? <laughs> yeah. That's good. Thanks. All right. Well, and, and you know, it's well, so, I think just because of the, because of the diversity of our, of our audience. Yes. Like, of hey, course. there's a virologist listening to our show. Who knew? <laughs> we, we, um, have the, the people for your position are listening right now for sure. So yeah. go check it out. All right. And, and precision vaccines, you know, I'm just going to hazard a guess here. Probably a good field to go yeah. into these days. I think it is. I was going to say, could be really interesting. Yeah, it yep. seemed, it, I bet this would be a really interesting position. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not looking for a postdoc position right now. <laughs> All right, time for some picks. Brienne, what do you have this week? Uh, so I have an article from The Atlantic uh, that I really enjoy. Um, I think I just uh, was so happy with some of the things that this author said that I, I, I decided I had to really love this article. So um, the article is called Show Your Immune System Some Love by Catherine Wu from The Atlantic. But the um, the... Subtitle is antibodies are great and all, but macrophages, B cells and helper T cells deserve some attention too. Um, and uh, so this is basically an explainer of uh, the immune system um, and talks about different parts of the immune system and what those parts do um, in a pretty sort of simple way. Um, it's probably one of the shorter um, descriptions of all of the cells of the immune response um, that I've seen. And people ask me for things like that pretty often. Uh, so if you sort of want a general idea of uh, what B cells and T cells and macrophages and dendritic cells are doing, um, then this is a nice little explainer. And Excellent. also the fact that uh, it <laughs> argues about the fact that T cells are important yes. um, is right. Uh, something speaking to my heart. <laughs> So I notice here on the recommended reading, there's an article by Ed Young. Immunology is where intuition goes to die. Dude, that, that, yes. that article is fantastic. Yes. Yeah. That article has a couple of quotes that are very spectacular. And it starts with an immunologist joke um, that I have kind of adopted because it is, I've never really heard an immunologist joke before. And this one really speaks to me. That's great. Um, so, I love the title. It's true. That, that article is really, really I good. I have to say the first sentence of this article, I'm lost because it says, if the immune system ran its own version of The Bachelor, antibodies would hands down get this season's final rose. I have no idea what The Bachelor is and what that means. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's fine to do that kind of stuff, but not everyone is going to know or should everyone know what The Bachelor is? Am I like what, the only person on the planet who doesn't know? I 
don't watch it either, I think, but if from just little bits and snippets I've picked up here and there, I think the rose is given like it, it's some reality elimination process and the final rose would be given to the winner. Yes. I don't even, I've never heard of it. It's like a dating thing. It's still going? It's on? It's, it like, is. Oh, okay. It well, is. it just goes to show. I don't watch TV. I have no idea what's on. But since your article was not directed at me anyway. No. No. Well, so, so let me give you the immunologist joke from sure, the other sure. article. Yes, because it's I, really good. I, it's really good. Um, an immunologist and a cardiologist are kidnapped. The kidnappers threaten to shoot one of them, but promise to spare whoever has made the greater contribution to humanity. The cardiologist said, well, I've identified drugs that have saved the lives of millions of people. Impressed, the kidnappers turned to the immunologist. What have you done, they ask. The immunologist says, the thing is, the immune system is very complicated. And the cardiologist says, just shoot me now. <laughs> I don't understand why you, the cardiologist would give up. Because they're sick of hearing about how complicated the immune oh, system okay. is. They're sick, they're, they're sick of listening to immunologists okay. talk about how complicated. So I, could, I could think of a joke involving, like a similar joke where you would have two scientists and one of them is a yeast geneticist. Yes, I, I've a, heard this. The awesome power yeah, the, the of- yeast, and just The yeast me. geneticist and the bacteriologist get kidnapped and then the yeast- Oh, that's the already a thing? The bacteriologist says, you know, I've developed antibiotics that have saved millions of lives. And the yeast geneticist says, um, well, let me tell you about the awesome power of yeast genetics. And the bi bacteriologist says, just shoot me now. Yeah, yeah. that's already a thing. Oh, I thought I was yeah. make. Oh. Yeah, I heard that. I think Aaron Mitchell told me that one, actually. Okay. All right, Alan, what do you have? Uh, so I have a pick from a blog that I've picked a couple of um, mm -hmm. articles from before, and I'm going to do it again. Uh, this is Andrew. Andrew Taylor um, maintains this blog called Southern Fried Science, and there's some other contributors too. But this is his article about a little educational project that he put together. Um, as he describes it, I built a horrifying cyborg sea turtle hatchling, so you can learn a little bit about behavioral ecology. And it's a it's a little um, cute little sea turtle looking robot that moves by flipping its flippers. And there's a little video of it on the site flipping along. And he's um, modified, it's based on a kit that you can buy online and he's modified the programming of it so that it will um, behave like a baby sea turtle and it'll go toward the brightest light. And then he explains why this is significant and why it matters for sea turtle conservation and how you can use this in a... Um, in a STEM class and uh, how it touches on a bunch of different concepts, not only in biology, but also in engineering and programming that you could incorporate into a lesson. Neat. I think it's cool how it's moving along there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cute. <laughs> that's cute. All right. Uh, my pick is uh, Thomas Brock. He just passed away and um, he was a great microbiologist. Uh, my, my, my pick is, a, is the obit in the times. Every year I, tell my class, my virology class, a little bit about PCR. And I say, you know, there was this microbiologist. Uh, he was just interested in what was growing in the hot springs around Yellowstone in the 1960s. He identified a bacteria, the Thermus aquaticus, you know, worked on it for a lot of years. And then years later, when PCR was developed, they used that polymerase from that heat-resistant bacteria uh, to get their assay to work. And... Um, I tell him that just shows this guy didn't try to invent anything. He was just curious and it led to something. And that's how science often works. So, uh, and, and the cool thing is, is that in college, I took a microbiology course and I used his textbook. Look at it. I oh, still have yes. it. Yes, biology his textbook is still uh, published and is still used biology, in a lot of microbiology courses. Biology of microorganisms. One so, um, I have, uh, what year is this one? Let's see. Thomas Brock, Bloomington, Indiana, and West Yellowstone, Montana. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Wisconsin. Where is the damned date? Where is it? Come on, folks. Where's the damned date? Is it possible that there isn't one? There's got oh, to be a copyright go. date on this it. This one is 1970. Um, I, I was at Cornell between 70 and 74. So at some point I took that course, but as a 
great. I immediately went and I saved it all these years. Isn't that cool? That's cool. Um, so great example. 1970, I was, I was done teething. Yeah. Yeah. You're young. You're a young guy. <laughs> Um, I uh, think this is really a great story. And all I say, you know, <sighs> headline writers. Okay. Thomas Brock, whose discovery paved the way for PCR test dies in 94. That's good. In 1966, he found heat resistant bacteria in a hot spring at Yellowstone. That led to the development of the chemical process behind the coronavirus test. That is, I wouldn't have said that because it sounds like it was just made for coronavirus. <laughs> It's not really a chemical process, is it? They're trying to they're trying to make it as attractive a current headline as possible. Okay, but you know, in my usual consistent way, yes. I'm criticizing it. <laughs> you're you're grumpy. You know, when uh, um, in the in the eighties, when we published the infectious uh, polio virus DNA, um, Harold Schmeck wrote an article in the Times, and the headline was "Polio virus made from." artificial genetic material. And then the lead was using off the shelf chemicals, scientists at MIT. And I'm like, what the hell off the shelf? <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, I guess they're off the shelf chemicals, right? Sure. I guess. Yeah. Although you so, go ahead. Yeah. Just, just, I was just going to say for anyone who is interested in the Brock textbook, um, I also used the Brock textbook as an undergraduate, though I used the ninth edition um, and the 16th edition came out in 2020. Is this the first edition I'm using? Let's see. Usually the first edition doesn't say it's doesn't the first say. edition. Yeah, because they well, don't they don't know there will be a second. Sometimes with, with like novels and stuff. Okay, I have a, a Dr. Seuss. It says first edition in the front. Hmm. And I let my kids read it and they trashed it. I could have gotten like hundreds of dollars for it. Can you imagine? Now I can't sell it anywhere because no eBay doesn't let you sell <laughs> Dr. Seuss anymore. Let's see. No, it doesn't say first edition, but it's 1970. That's probably first edition. It is, because if it were second, it would say second edition, right? Right. I think so. Yeah, it's a cool book. And I was reading it. It's just so simple, right? One person, <laughs> he wrote it himself. Is it still one author or is it more? No, it's not. It, they're a group of authors. Yeah, and in fact, figures. it is one of many textbooks where I don't actually know if he is writing it anymore. Um, well, he certainly kept, isn't now. Right, but they kept the name yeah. Rock Biology of Microorganisms. Yeah, like Fields Virology. Fields right? Virology, yeah. Okay. We have two listener picks. Uh, April writes, I was listening to another podcast, Scandalous. Yes, it is Scandalous, but... And I heard about this path in New York City, the High Line. Hmm. She provides a link. Be sure to look at the photos. It's on my bucket list. Yeah, the High Line. Actually, I've never been on it, but I've seen pictures of it and it's wonderful. But I used to be down, I used to go down there before they they built stuff on it when it was a railroad, a raised railroad platform uh, that they used to move meats around in lower mm -hmm. Manhattan, I think, right? Yeah. And part of it would go into buildings, right? Where they, the cars, it's very cool, very cool. Yeah. I mean, what a brilliant thing to make a cool park out of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool, although the, I've only been there once and I remember it being extremely uncomfortably hot that day. Mm -hmm. So I think I should go there at a, on a day where it might be more comfortable and more enjoyable. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, so they have parks and buildings, right? Do they have buildings on it or no, just parks? No, it's really, it's really just sort of a walking place where you have some great views and sort of parks. I think there are, there are buildings next to it, like residential, yes. very expensive mm -hmm. residential buildings. That's brilliant. Really great idea to, uh, to do that. I'm, I'm always impressed when cities do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't always, right? No, right. Uh, Michelle writes, hi, Twivers. Here's a possible listener pick. This was sent to me by a friend and has been very useful in explaining to family members and friends that you really can't compare the different vaccine efficacies and that possibly wait, waiting for a vaccine with higher efficacy number rather than taking the first one that is offered to you is not logical and provides a link to a YouTube video, why you can't compare COVID-19 vaccines. The short seven vid minute video is easy to follow, clearly explaining what the vaccine's efficacy rate actually means. Not the same one you picked last week, is it, uh, Brienne? No, the one that I picked was a, a, a minute and a half. Okay, um, okay. And it was really more of a view, uh, an, an image. 
I sure wish the media would focus more on information like this or at least educate themselves properly before creating misleading headlines. Well, you, you ask for miracles, Michelle. <laughs> they, they always say, we don't have time to check things. We have to get 20 articles out a day, and that's the way it is. <laughs> My oldest son, who is an advanced care paramedic, put me onto TWIV last summer. Thank you, oldest son. You've been a lush tropical island in a sea of confusion and misinformation. While I don't understand everything you discuss, I faithfully tune in to every one of your TWIV podcasts during my morning walks. Keep up the good work, the banter. And yes, you do make a big difference in helping us through these difficult times. Michelle, just a retired former health and safety guy, or narc, as Rich would say. <laughs> That's true, he would. And who yes. lives in Winnipeg. Manitoba, Canada, where the temperature is minus two Celsius. Wow. That's balmy in Winnipeg, isn't it? It never gets warm up there. Is that it's, right? It's it's Winnipeg, I think, of being cold. Isn't that pretty far north? It's Got pretty me. far north. Well, Michelle, sometimes I don't understand the things we talk about either, so don't feel so bad. <laughs> All right. I love our, our listeners, don't you? Oh, they're awesome. Yeah, they're great. Letters are just just amazing. Just love it. Thank you all for writing. By the way, if you'd like to write a letter, you can send it to twiv at microbe.tv. If you want to send it to Daniel, that would be Daniel at microbe.tv. Not hard. Okay. I don't mean to be stern or anything, but I always get emails from people who say, How do I write Daniel a letter? I say, just listen to the podcast, right? <laughs> Daniel at Microbe TV or Twiv at Microbe TV. The show notes where you will find links to the papers we discuss and the letters and so forth. Microbe.tv slash Twiv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. We'd love your support. We would absolutely adore it. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Brianne Barker is over at Drew University Bioprof Barker on the Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Alan Doves at alandove.com. And Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral. <laughs>